this is a rock. It's from Southern California, but not originally. It's been through some rough times in its life, an earthquake or two, and not to mention how often it's dealt with the other dynamic processes going on within the Earth. You see, this isn't just any ordinary rock. Just like human beings, every rock has a story. A unique history that brought it from the depths of the Earth to the surface, and the details hidden within rocks are critical for understanding everything from earthquakes to mountain ranges and geologic time. As a geologist, I've interacted with a number of amazing rocks in my day. But the story of this one right here is definitely not like the rest. Let me tell you a tale of this rock's intricate journey and how that journey crossed paths with my own, resulting in several life and rock-changing moments along the way. So this rock story begins some 65 million years ago when it formed, sitting very, very deep within the Earth at extreme temperature and pressure. That's right. When T-Rex and Allosaurus are getting squashed by a meteor on the Yucatan Peninsula, suffocating from the fumes of unprecedented volcanic eruptions, our friend here is none the wiser, but still undergoing a number of important changes of its own. We know this because rocks record their story internally. Sort of like how you might keep a record of your life in a journal, so too does a rock record its story in its textures and compositions. Some minerals even record when specific chapters in a rock story happened, like adding a date to your journal entry. As geologists, we can date these minerals, flipping back through the pages to find out when certain parts of a story were written. By 25 million years ago, this rock begins its journey to the surface of the Earth, cooling to about 150 degrees Celsius and sitting five to six kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. You see, the Earth has an internal heat source, and as rocks move from the deepest parts of the Earth closer to the surface, they cool from incredibly hot temperatures to, well, the temperature of this room we're sitting in right now. And so for the first 52 to 59 million years of its life, this rock dealt with some major rock-changing events. But nothing, absolutely nothing, compares to when the big one makes its grand entrance. Between 6 and 12 million years ago, the San Andreas Fault, arguably the most famous fault in the world, starts to shake things up. When the two sides of a fault move past one another very rapidly, that's an earthquake. And when earthquakes happen, the rocks surrounding the fault become incredibly fractured, busted up, and damaged. In geology, we call this fracturing and busting up deformation. And the deformation, or deformed area around the fault, is the fault damage zone. The fault damage zone is perhaps one of the richest records available to a geologist. Every little small fault, fracture, and mineral in the fault damage zone is tied to the story of the fault. Think about it like an after party. After the main event, so the Oscars, a movie premiere, or in this case, an earthquake, all of the excitement, food, music, and dancing is moved elsewhere into the fault damage zone so that the celebration can continue. And think about what you can learn about what really went down at the main event by talking with everyone who made it all the way to the after party. In the same way, studying fault damage zones is the ideal window through which to see the story of a fault through time. Finally, after the appearance of the San Andreas Fault, after this rock gets incorporated into the San Andreas Fault damage zone, it makes its final ascent to the surface of the Earth. And that is where our understanding of this rock story sat until I came along and everything changed. When I visited Utah State University as a potential graduate student, my now advisor and several other professors took me to take a closer look at one of their key field research areas. Just east of Willard, Utah, where the Wasatch Mountains begin to rise out of the Great Salt Lake, the damage zone of a slightly less famous but still incredibly important Wasatch Fault is exposed. The Wasatch Fault damage zone has a number of small faults coated in a metallic reddish-purple mineral called hematite. And in some places, these fault surfaces are so smooth and reflective, you can actually see your face in them. These were easily some of the most beautiful rocks I had ever seen. And trust me, I've seen a lot of really cool rocks. So imagine my reaction when I learned there were rocks very similar to those in the Wasatch Fault Damage Zone that existed in Southern California, 
tied to the San Andreas Fault of all things and that I could work on if I decided to come to Utah State for graduate school. How in the world could I say no? I cite this as the moment that ultimately led me to this rock and my research on the San Andreas Fault. Now, while based on what I've already told you, it may seem like we know everything there is to know about this rock story, in reality there are some crucial gaps regarding the San Andreas that we know very little about. We have a good idea of when the San Andreas developed in general, but when was deformation, that fracturing and busting up, occurring in the part of the San Andreas fault damage zone that this rock is from? Ultimately, we need to know when did the after party start? How long did the after party last? And what in the world was going on at this after party? These are important questions because faulting and deformation are not simple occurrences, especially in Southern California. This is an after party with dancing and music and games and 10 kinds of dip that may even get broken up by the cops and reconvene multiple times throughout the evening. <laughs> Acquiring additional details of this rock story will therefore help us understand how the fault operates and predict how it might behave in the future. That's why we turn to the fault damage zone, our after party record, to see what we can learn. So if we need to know about time, wouldn't it be nice if there were something, anything, you know, like a mineral, that we could date in order to answer our outstanding questions about this rock story? Well, I didn't just pick up this rock from the San Andreas fault damage zone because it looks cool. Just like the Wasatch rocks, this rock has a very small fault coated in a metallic reddish purple mineral, hematite. Not only can we date hematite, but this hematite is tied to the story of the San Andreas Fault. Dating it might therefore provide valuable insight into this rock's story. Despite all of the possible complications that accompany dating hematite, especially in faults, the hematite from the San Andreas Fault damage zone told us exactly what we hoped it would. During the period between 300,000 to 700,000 years ago, right in the middle of woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, and our early hominid ancestors, this damage zone was deforming, possibly via earthquakes, and the hematite formed in the damage zone as a result. We have effectively documented a 400,000-year-long period of earthquake after earthquake after earthquake with reconvening after party following each main event. I don't think I can even begin to impress how ridiculously amazing these new details of this rock story are. Hopefully just me standing up here being incredibly stoked and exasperately trying to explain it to you will do the trick. But in a more concrete sense, we now have a better understanding of the complicated history for this section of the San Andreas. There's been a lot going on at this after party in the last million years. It's just so incredibly difficult to say when deformation was occurring and to do that for something like the San Andreas Fault, well, that's a really big deal. And, you know, in so many ways, this isn't just a big deal for science, but it's also a big deal for me personally. I am, at my core, a geologist and plan to be for the rest of my life. My research is a fundamental part of who I am. It defines me as a scientist, but more importantly, it defines me as a human being. One thing I often think about is how every time I pick up a rock and add it to my research sample suite, I am inevitably changing the very story I'm trying so hard to tell, both the rocks and my own. But in doing so, I have become an important component of this rock story. If not for me and my research, this rock may have sat at the surface of the Earth for a very long time, waiting for the next indeterminate step in its adventure, its story untold. Instead, it also sits up on this stage today not only a new piece in our understanding of the San Andreas, but also the cornerstone of my own geologic story. Ultimately, this rock took a journey, and I took a journey. And once the two intersected, neither were really ever the same again. <laughs>